Good morning. Welcome to Westview Baptist Church. My name is Rick Bowling. I'm the pastor at Westview, and we're so glad you decided to join us today. Today we begin our Advent season, and so we're excited about that. We're going to be talking about the uh, Advent of Christ, uh, not only the past, but the future. So excited about that. And hey, if you would like to contribute to the ministry of Westview, you may do so by going online to wbcshelby.org. And you can give there. We certainly appreciate your gifts. And so let's just jump right in today. And uh, today's message is called A Lifetime of Hope. You know, uh, we think about this time of year where uh, people hope for many things. You know, good health, healthy relationships, adequate provisions, you know, hope, a hope, real hope. Of course, children are hoping for gifts and for uh, Christmas, but none of this is guaranteed. And it's unseen, these things I've just mentioned, but we have faith that it will happen. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. What is it that we hope for the most? And what is it that interferes with our hope? And what do we do about it? Well, the Christmas story certainly has a big uh, promise within it, but also we have the promises that when Jesus left this earth as well. The first thing I want to do is I want to uh, jump into uh, the book of Jeremiah. We're going to just look at a few verses there before we get into Luke. Because, you know, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that there was one that was coming. Hope was coming. The Lord of hope came... To and, and what did he do? What did the Lord of hope come for? He came to save us. That's the first point I want you to see today. We see, in, in fact, in Isaiah 61, one, uh, uh, Isaiah's pro, uh, he's prophesying about Jesus coming. And he makes this, this very promise right here, this word. He says, The Spirit of the Sovereign the Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he goes on and says some other things about he sent me to bind up the broken heart and, and so forth. But we're just going to stop right there for a minute. Just that, to proclaim good news to the poor, not just to those who do not have, but those who have a, a spiritual poverty, if you will, those who are willing to recognize their need for God. He came to give good news to all of us, specifically the, the poor. And so we're excited about that because God always keeps his promises. Look what he said to the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 33, starting with verse 14. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. You see, God always keeps his promises. And we see it throughout history. You know, from the uh, end of the Old Testament, the intertestamental uh, time we call it, to the New Testament, uh, the, the last time that we see that God spoke to the prophets till that was approximately 400 years. Now, I mean, that's a long time to be hoping, right? But they stayed faithful, and, and uh, some people fell away, obviously. We can even look back, you know, this is the time of year where um, we see the celebration of Hanukkah for the Jewish people. And uh, Judah, Judas Maccabee, uh, he was a, a Jewish person during that time, and it was about 167 B.C., somewhere around there. Uh, the uh, Syrians had taken over the temple. Um, they had just desecrated it. You know, they were sacrificing pigs in there. They had um, uh, statues of Zeus, and so there was a revolt, and the Maccabees, uh, Judas Maccabee headed up, and they took over the temple. Uh, they couldn't take it anymore. And so uh, this uh, feast, they call it later on, this the feast of dedication because they dedicated the temple and something unique happened then that gave them hope. They went to light the menorah and they only had enough oil to light for one day. And so, but what they did, they, light, they were lighting it until they could get more. And each day they kept, it kept, they were able to light it. They could not believe it. So for eight days, that menorah was lit. And it was to them their hope that the Messiah was coming. It was still alive. And it was a miraculous thing. 
and that was in the midst of those 400 years away. And, and so we see even in the scripture, Jesus talks about the Feast of Dedication, the dedication of the temple, uh, which became known as Hanukkah today. And that's still going on. So God always keeps his promises. And he said he's made this, this promise here. He says, I'm, I'm going to fulfill the good promise that I made to Judah and Israel. He's talking about the coming of Christ. Verse 15, in those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. You know, God, his ways are unconventional, but it always gives us hope. And we look in Matthew 1, and uh, this is something that a lot of people just skim over in verses 2 through 16. It's all about the genealogy from the beginning up, up to Jesus and the birth of, the birth of Jesus. And it, it's filled, and this, when he says here from uh, this branch of David, David is in the middle of, uh, he's in the middle of this genealogy. And all these people in there, they're thinking this royal person that, you know, David is a, um, he's a king. And, you know, uh, that's, this way is not conventional because what we see in that genealogy are these people that were, you know, a prostitute, um, you know, a deceiver, Jacob, you know, it, it goes on and on the list. And so it gives us hope that, that yes, even through this line, this line of people, God uses imperfect people. And we're going to see as the Savior comes. So he gives us hope that no matter what we've done, where we have been, God will come. He comes to us. Finally, look what he says in verse 16. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety he says, this is that name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Those who believe, he's saying, will be identified with the righteous one, the Lord, our righteous Savior. And that's the church now. And so we see this, this prophecy uh, is fulfilled in the scripture. And, you know, it came at Bethlehem. And one of the things that we see with the unique thing that, that Jesus came to save us. And we're going to see that at the very end is, you know, that in the scripture is that, that when he came, he lived on this earth. He offered salvation through people who believed in him. But then he left and he said something very important. He said, I will be back. I will return. And he gives some urgent, um, for the second advent, as we call it. And so we're going to talk about that for just a minute. We're kind of, I know we're fast forward in this, but it's important to see that with the Christmas story, that was the beginning. And that Jesus offers salvation for all who believe, not just those who were there then, but even to this day. But he promised again that he's going to return. But when he returns, he's not going to be like he has here this this time frame of grace of living and all that he's going to return as you're going to see it's going to be quick it's going to be different but he's coming back and so what does hope do hope urges us to be vigilant of course they were doing that in the old testament they were telling the people to get ready even though that was 400 years from the old testament and and before before that but he was uh, even as john the baptist came be vigilant so hope urges to be vigilant we're going to uh, switch over to luke 21 verses 25 and through, uh, 26, and we're going to skip a little spot uh, to 34, 36, and we'll finish the rest of it in our third point. So hope urges us to be vigilant. Let's look at Luke 21. So remember now, Jesus has said he's going to come back. And he says this right here in verse tw uh, 25, 26. He says, what's going to happen? Now, he's just described some different uh, events are going to take place as the time is near. We don't know when that's going to be, but he's going to advent him coming back. He says, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexing at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint, he says, from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And then, uh, we'll just stop right there for a minute. So he's saying there's going to be another advent. There's going to be cosmic signs that are going to take place. You know, there's a lot of things that are out there. And uh, I, I watched a really uh, neat, we've been doing this on Wednesday night, of, um, about the signs of the end times. And in Matthew 24, 
very correlates this quite a bit. And there's a lot of things and in, in different phases that we see in the scripture here. And one of them is we see uh, wars and rumors of wars. We see deception by people who, who are false Christs who proclaim that has happened and already happened already in our lifetime. There's famines. There's there's a lot of famines that are taking place. There's pestilence. You know we've got COVID right now. There's um, we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. There's earthquakes, uh, many many thousands of earthquakes. Uh, there's the falling away from the faith. That's what we call apostasy and betrayal and hatred. Oh, we see it within our nation right now. There's the persecution of Christians around the world. There's this increased deception by what we call false prophets and uh, increased wickedness and de decreased love. Oh, my. Spreading the gospel go globally. That is happening. That's a good thing. And so those are just some of the things that are signs in the uh, what uh, Gary Hamrick calls um, the first two phases that he believes that we're in. And so there's a, finally the third phase is the appearance of the Antichrist. And this is the time that when there's the great tribulation on earth and the rise of more false Christ and, and so forth in prophets. And when Jesus talks about returning. But we're already having a lot of these cosmic signs. And so hope urges us to be vigilant. We see it right here in the scriptures. Look at verse, let's just look over 34, 35. He, said, he says, uh, I'll ask you, what interferes with us? Be careful, he says, of your hearts will be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close on you suddenly, like a trap. Now, that's something we don't like to think about, but, you know, I think of a trap. You could be walking through the woods, and you don't see anything. You're just, you know, ho-humming along, and suddenly something slaps around your foot like a bear trap, or maybe it's a, a hole dug in the ground, and it's just that quick. And he's saying that's how it's going to take place. It's going to be, these things are going to close in on you suddenly, he says, um, like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the earth. Not just everyone. Um, it, 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 we're all going to experience when Jesus is going to come back, but for those who... Yes, the persecution is taking place of Christians, but oh my goodness, there is a good side to this. But it's coming. It's coming. And, you know, notice the things he says about be careful with our hearts. I mean, what interferes? Well, you know, it's interesting as, as we look here, we, we have this, this place deep within us. Um, uh, I, there's a book I've been reading. I highly uh, encourage you. It's a... Uh, by Max Licato called Because of Bethlehem. And he tells a story about when Max was, when he was a kid, I mean, not when he was a kid, uh, recently in the last few years. And he was driving along, and there was a kid, he called him a kid, a teenager. And he's, he's driving along the road, it's at Thanksgiving, and this, this uh, kid does a quick U-turn. He says, he almost hit my car. And so Max just gives a, a long, drawn out horn, uh, blowing of his horn, and and he proceeds to say, he comes up to him by a stoplight, do you know what you about did? And the teenager gives him the bird finger, you know, the middle finger. And Max says, hey, you need to watch that wave. And the teenager's like, make me. And so Max, he challenges the kid. He says, you know, the saints in, in heaven, the angels, everything was urging me not to do it. He says, but something activated the punk inside of me and that had been there from decades ago, you know, when he was in high school. And Max challenged him. He says, well, where do you want to go? And that teenager said his eyes got as wide as hamburger patties and, and, and the Teenager says, well, well, let's just settle this in, at the shopping mall. And Max's like, no, 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 that's way too crowded. He says, follow me, and he speeds off. And now Max, you know, he's thinking I left this kid behind, but apparently he says the kid got scared, and, and he turned off the road. Max thought about it. He couldn't believe that he dared this kid to fight. As Max talks about a little going a little deeper, he says he blames the the behavior on the punk, you know, like a punk on inside of himself. 
he says, I, I forgot who this kid was and uh, who he was in the, in the himself, uh, Max himself, and who the teenager was. He says that he wasn't a creation of God or he wasn't a miracle or fearfully and wonderfully made. He says, I saw the teenager as a disrespectful jerk and I let him bring the disrespectful jerk in me out. You know, the Bible calls this the punkish, punkish tendency. Sin. The sinful nature. And the sin nature is a stubborn, a self-centered attitude that we have. It says, my way or the highway, according to Max. The sinful nature is all about self. It's pleasing self. It's, it's promoting self. It's, it's preserving self. Sin is selfish. And folks, whether you want to admit it or not, we all have a sin nature. We're born with it. I mean, you know, I, I think of examples of, of my kids and, you know, when they couldn't even really talk and they would look at me and they knew it was something they weren't supposed to do and they'd get ready to do it and I'd say, no, nope, and they would do it anyway. And you would discipline them and they might go back and do it again. It's all within us. I love this quote from Max. He says, the heart of heaven, excuse me, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Of, yes. God entered in to take it away. That's why Bethlehem is so important. Jesus came to take that sin part away. To keep the punkish tendency at bay. In fact, in Matthew 1, uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 20 and 21, it's a, it's a time that, a scripture that's very reassuring, and it, and it tells, you know, the very reason that, that Christ came. It says this um, in verse 21. Joseph, uh, well, it says after, it says, Consider this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to Joseph. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Do you know uh, in the Hebrew that means Yeshua? Because he will save his people from their sins. Yeshua means Jesus saves. And so sin is what interferes. As we see this and we're talking about the second coming, we're to be ready. <clears throat> and Jesus saves us from that sin. And I pray that if you don't have that relationship, you will, you will enter into that today. Well, what are we to do? What, what, are we, what must we be on watch? We, we cannot get comfortable or complacent. I mean, Judas Maccabee couldn't take it anymore in the Old Testament, we see. But we can't do that in our own lives. And we look at verse 36, what he says, Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Yes, we have to, uh, to, to stay alert, to be vigilant. That's what hope urges us to do. Because our hope is in him. The hope is in what he promises when he comes back. Besides, you know, for those who are saved, those who are believers. That's the good news. Which leads us to the third point. Hope means joyful anticipation. Now, let's look at, we're going to go back to verse 27 in this passage. And I want you to hear what he says. This is after all the signs of what he says. He says, at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. And, you know, you got to understand that this, was very, this very thing is what Jesus had told the disciples in Acts verse 1 when he told them that the promise of the Holy Spirit. And right then they're talking about, well, you know, uh, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom? They're thinking, you know, that they're still thinking about that. And this is when he says, you don't need to know the times or the dates and all that. He's not he's talking about the second coming. You don't need to know that. And he says, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit, you know, to, to go into all the nations and be a witness to them. 
And this is what he says. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him in their sight. As they were looking intently upon the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men, dressed in white, stood. And they said, Why, why uh, men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you to heaven, he will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Folks, the promise, he's coming back just as he left, as we see that beautiful, uh, here Jesus has had this incredible, his life, his death, the resurrection, and he walked this earth for 40 days with the disciples in the resurrected state, and then he ascends back to home with the heavenly father in the heaven. And it's what they saw, the last thing, is saying he's going to come back the same way. Folks, that is a joyful anticipation to know that. And notice what he goes on to say. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. You know, he redeems us from our sins, but the final redemption is he's going to restore us. And then we look in the scripture, he goes on over. Uh, he says, uh, I tells him a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things, all these things happening he's talking about, you're going to know the kingdom of God is near. And so even though it might be what we would consider negative things, folks, as a Christian, you can get excited. You can have joyful anticipation because he's saying the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, he says this generation, and we believe he's, and there's different uh theories on this, but believe one of, them, one of them is that this generation, he's talking about the generation during this time, he says, will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. He says, but my words will never pass away. We can have joyful anticipation because he is coming back just like he left. Because he made us aware that it will be impossible to stop the resistance to the way that God, the way of God prior to the end. You're, you're not going to be able to stop it. We know that. We can have joyful anticipation because it means he's coming back. Because we hold with conviction the unchanging of God's word. He says his words will never pass away. We must respond with faithful vigilance. We must. No more business as usual. The advent at the end may bring its own temptations. But he's saying we, may, we need to avoid its influences and, and its behaviors that are not of God. How do we counter? I'm going to say it one more time. Be on alert. The, event, the end will be sudden, he says. Unexpected like a trap. And it will be upon us all. And so we're to be vigilant. We're to be in prayer. We're to be ready. joyful anticipation it will allow you to stand what do we have what do we get what's the joy in all this the book of revelation sums it up quite well and you know it's there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth he says there's a Revelation 21 verses 1 through 8. I, I'm not going to give it. I'm not going to read it all. I'm going to give you a summation of it. And this is a, a, a quote from Max's book of it. Uh, uh, I thought it was really good. God is always near. Uh, he's always near us. He gets us. He saves us. He's always near us. And we think about Bethlehem. That was just the beginning. But Jesus has promised a repeat performance. Bethlehem Act 2. Max calls it. No silent night this time, however. The skies will open, the trumpets will blast, and a new kingdom will begin. He will empty the tombs and melt the winter of death. He will press his thumb against the collective cheek of his children, and he will wipe away all their tears. Be gone, sorrow, sickness, wheelchairs, and cancer. Enough of you, screams of fear and nights of horror. Death, you die. Life, you reign. And you see the manger, he says, invites us, even dares us to believe the best is yet to be. And folks, it could begin today. There will be a final redemption. 
that full consummation that we're redeemed from this life and all the pain and all that. We're redeemed from our sinfulness and we won't we won't sin once he comes back. We'll be in that perfect state or when we die and we come to meet with him. One of those two things are already promised. And the final judgment for all those, there's a judgment of between believers and non-believers. And so he has given us a lifetime of hope. I hope you will accept that greatest gift, the promise of hope that comes from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your powerful word. Lord, it's a time of year where we do need that hope, but we need that hope every single day. Lord, the hope that only comes in Jesus Christ. And I pray if you are hearing this message today, whether it's the first time or the thousandth time, that you will listen, that you will be vigilant, you will realize that could happen today. This is not a scare tactic. I'm just preaching the word of God. Lord, it's your word. It's your promise. You don't want to see any perish, but all to be saved and come to know you. He wants you to know him. He will save you from your sin. He already has. All you have to do is confess it and believe in him and become a follower of Jesus Christ. And you will enter that eternal kingdom right now. Father, help us as believers. Lord, like Max, to realize we still have that sin nature and we have to crucify it every day, every moment. So Lord, that we may be vigilant and ready for the end time. Lord, which is the beginning of a new life of eternity. Lord, we thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I want to thank you for joining us today. Hey, if you made that most important decision today to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you have entered in the kingdom of God. I would love to hear from you. You can contact me again at wbcshelby.org. My name is Rick Bowling. Or contact a local pastor in your area or a trusted friend that's a believer. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.